Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning as it is fall and it is gorgeous outside. We're glad to have you here. There are a number of announcements that are in your bulletin and I ask you to look at those at your leisure. Uh, I would note a couple. The election night supper gave thanks to everybody and they got $1,305.60 raised, so praise God for that. The Bible study group that meets on Sundays at 4 will not meet today at 4 um, because of a number of conflicts with schedules and things. What we're going to try and do is have it next Sunday and the following Sunday. So instead of every other Sunday, it'll be two Sundays in a row. Oh, shoot. Right. No, it won't be next Sunday. We're just going to have to skip until the 27th. I'm preaching at a commissioning service for a new pastor somewhere. Um, session will meet upstairs Thursday, November 17th at 4 p.m. So everybody who's here, mark that on your calendar, in your phone, whatever. Um, Though it's normally done during joys and concerns, I also want to mention here that Stan's biopsies came back cancerous, and so we need to pray. They're going to start treatments again and things, and the family needs our support. This is Christine's brother-in-law. Are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? I just want you uh, I still need some, I need to sign up for a cook for apple salad for um, that Thanksgiving, the community dinner. And uh, whoever's bringing the salad, you know, have them there by Saturday or Sunday morning, please. Okay, so apple, sa apple salad, is that what you called it? We need apple salad for the Thanksgiving luncheon. So, see you, Vaughn. Any other announcements that we need to make at this time? If not, then we're going to prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we have a special thing. Apparently, a couple of years back, you had somebody uh, named Kelly Mooney who actually came to the church and sang. And uh, it's a gorgeous piece that she sang. And so listen to the words uh, today as she is played. placed on his head he knew that he would soon be dead he said did you forget me father did you they nailed him to a wooden cross soon all the world would feel the loss of Christ the King before us hallelujah Yeah. 
that truly this was Jesus Christ our Savior he looked with fear upon his sword and turned other thing I forgot to mention about that song. As noted in the bulletin, it was by Leonard Cohen, the tune. The words were actually by Kelly. She wrote some Easter tunes, words to them. But he died this week, Leonard Cohen. So this was somewhat of a tribute to him as well and some of the beautiful music that he has created. So we want to remember him as well. Now please stand as you are able and join me in the responsive call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and pray, bless his name. Bless the Lord. Now let us bless his name as we sing our opening hymn number one. Holy, holy, holy.
Please be seated. Now, please open your responsive reading book to number 36. This is about spiritual treasure and is taken from Matthew 6. Don't store up treasures here on earth where they can erode away or may be stolen. Store them in heaven where they will never lose their value and are safe from the If your prophets are in heaven, your heart will be there too. If your eye is pure, there will be sunshine in your soul. But if your eye is clouded with evil thoughts and desires, you are in deep spiritual darkness. And oh, how deep that darkness can be. You cannot serve two masters, God and money, for you will hate one and love the other, or else the other way around. So my counsel is, don't worry about things, food, drink, and clothes. For you already have life and a body, and they are far more important than what to eat and wear. Look at the birds. They don't worry about what to eat. They don't need to sow or reap or store up food, for your Heavenly Father feeds them. And you are far more valuable to Him than they are. Will all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothes? Look at the field lilies. They don't worry about theirs. Yet King Solomon in all his glory was not clothed as beautifully as they. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow, won't he more surely care for you, O oh, man of little faith? So don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen? For they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well that you need them. And he will give them to you if you give him first place in your life and live as he wants you to. So don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of tomorrow too. Live one day at a time. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for people. Let us join together in a prayer of thanksgiving printed in your bulletin and then take time silently to also give thanks. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father, we thank you for the gifts which you have given to us and to all humankind. We thank you for the beauty which you have put into the world. You are the mighty creator. We thank you for all the nobility which you have put into the hearts of people. May we be people after your own heart. We thank you for the skill which you have put into the minds and hands of people. May we be good stewards of your creation. We thank you too, O oh God, for the visions and the ideals which you have placed in the souls of people. May we keep our eyes fixed on you, determined to do your will. We thank you for the blessing which we enjoy every day. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your greatest and best gift to all the world, in whom you have given us yourself and all your love. Accept our sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise for your love's sake. Now let us praise God in song.
Please be seated. Now as we approach God's word, please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. Ever loving God, whose word is life and whose touch brings healing and salvation, make your word real to us now. Speak your presence in our hearts and lives that we may know the reality of your grace and bear it to others in your name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and is found on page 1068 in your pew Bible. The opening phrase of this chapter appears at first sight to be nothing more than an indication of when these things took place. In ancient times, people counted years in terms of how long the current king had been reigning. Isaiah's vision took place during the year that Uzziah died, though whether it was before or after Uzziah's death is not clear, probably before, otherwise it would have made more sense to say the first year of Jotham's reign. Many people think there is a deeper significance, however, linking Isaiah's vision to Uzziah's death. The death of a monarch, especially one who had ruled well, was likely a time of national mourning and probably of much uncertainty as people wondered what sort of king his son would turn out to be. There was always a tendency to put too much trust in the king and his power rather than in the invisible God who was Lord over all. Isaiah's vision was a strong reminder that regardless who was seated on the throne in the royal palace, God was seated on his throne in heaven. He would reign in his sovereign power and majesty and holiness, as he always had and always would. The only question was, who on earth would faithfully carry out his commands? Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. God is good. This text is part of the narrative lectionary, which I've mentioned before. A lectionary is a series of readings. There are a number of them that are out there. I started using the narrative lectionary last year uh, for the year, and, and I've been using it again this year. But this scripture was chosen way back in like 2011, 2012. But its timing couldn't be better. Even I had decided to use it several months ago, not knowing where we would be today. As we approach our text for today, let me share a little context with you, a little more in depth than Pauline did. King Uzziah in the Bible was one of the good kings of Judah. His father was King Amaziah. Ministering during Uzziah's reign were the prophets Hosea, Isaiah, and Amos. 
Now King Uzziah was 16 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned for 52 years in Judah from approximately 790 to 739 BC. He, quote, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, unquote, as his father Amaziah had done. And we know this from 2 Chronicles chapter 26. King Uzziah sought the Lord during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. Unquote. This Zechariah is most likely a godly prophet to whom Uzziah listened. As long as Uzziah made a point to seek God, God made him prosperous. Unfortunately, after Zechariah died, Uzziah made some mistakes later in life. King Uzziah in the Bible is shown as a wonderfully intelligent and innovative king under whom the state of Judah prospered. He was used by God to defeat the Philistines and the Arabs. He built fortified towers and strengthened the armies of Judah. And he commissioned skilled men to create devices that could shoot arrows and large stones at enemies from the city walls. I believe we call those catapults. He also built up the land and the Bible says, quote, he loved the soil. The Ammonites paid tribute to King Uzziah, and his fame spread all over the ancient world as far as the border of Egypt. Might not have been quite King Solomon's reign, but it was certainly impressive. Unfortunately, King Uzziah's fame and strength led him to become proud, and this led to his downfall. He committed an unfaithful act by entering the temple of God to burn incense on the altar himself. Burning incense on the altar was something only the priests could do. By attempting to do this himself, Uzziah was basically saying he was above following the law. It was not a humble thing to do. Eighty courageous priests, led by Azariah, tried to stop the king. They said, It is not right for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who have been consecrated to burn incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have been unfaithful, and you will not be honored by the Lord God. Uzziah became angry with the priests who dared to confront him. But while he was raging at the priests in their presence before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy broke out on his forehead. Uzziah ran from the temple in fear because God had struck him. And from that day to the day of his death, King Uzziah was a leper. He lived in a separate palace and was not allowed to enter the temple of the Lord. He ruled through Jotham. But nevertheless, the projects and things were done in his name and by his word. Now Isaiah was a priest as well as a prophet. There are sources that question whether Isaiah, who began his ministry in the time of Uzziah, was close to the king or not, and whether he had regretted not prophesying properly to the king and giving him an opportunity to repent. While these may be worthy questions to consider, I don't think they necessarily had anything to do with where Isaiah was and the vision he received. Regardless of Isaiah's relationships, this was a time of political upheaval. The king who had ruled for 52 years, longest in this time of two kingdoms, had finally died. All the work he had done, all the reputation he had built in the world, all the progress he had made, all of it could come very easily crashing down. And with that could come invasion. Most sources agree that Isaiah was likely in the earthly temple at the time of his vision, some believe he was in there performing cultic duties for one of their festivals. Others have argued he went in there like King Hezekiah to lay his trouble before the Lord. Whatever his reason for being there, while he was there, Isaiah had this amazing vision that Pauline read today. And I want to note several things about it, and we'll explore each a little bit. First of all, let me tell you some things I'm not going to talk about in any depth the angels, and all the traditions surrounding them, a detailed discussion of the attributes of God, and in particular His holiness, and the missionary or prophetic call that Isaiah received. So you might say, well, wait a minute, what am I going to talk about? Because that's pretty much all of it. Well, Isaiah apparently had an eye for detail. 
He gives an amazing description of the heavenly throne room, the seraphim and their song, which was antiphonal, that means back and forth. He talks about the lintel shaking. How many here even know what a lintel is? The lintel is basically the door jam. You know the place where you go when there's an earthquake because they say it will be more secure? Those were what was shaking. Gives you an idea of just how powerful the vibration was. He talks about the smoke of God's train filling the temple. Now this is not a choo-choo train. This is a train like a bride has, you know, that comes after it. Or the kings frequently wore robes and they would have a train, a long cape that would follow them. The smoke of God's train, God's train was apparently of smoke, filled the temple. And what is interesting is that he does not describe God himself. I don't think it was because God told him not to, nor because he didn't want to. I think he couldn't. The reality of God's presence was so overwhelming that Isaiah could do little more than panic. Think about it. What is the first thing the angels usually have to say when visiting us folks here on earth? Be not afraid. Thank you. Why do you think that's the case? Because they look so amazing and their glory, the reflected glory of the Lord shines. Now imagine, try to picture the scene where there's something so incredible that Isaiah isn't even phased by the presence of many angels singing. They're just the background. Those angels sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And I want to note two things about this phrase. Hebrew uses repetition to show intensity or superlativeness. That is, that they have no good, better, or best in their language. So by saying, holy, 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 they're saying that God is the holiest thing that there is. The word holy in Hebrew means separate or other at its core. So Isaiah is viewing someone who is so other, so transcendent, so pure, so righteous, so glorious, that his only reaction is to fall on his knees and say, Woe is me, I am undone. I know that your translation said ruined, but the Hebrew word is best translated as undone and speaks of unraveling or coming apart. Isaiah's mind and spirit were literally coming apart at the seams as he realized how incredibly far above him this being was and how poor he was in his sinful state. Then an angel comes down bringing something to touch Isaiah's mouth and tells him that God is purifying those very lips by his grace so that Isaiah might stand in his presence without being destroyed. And by the way, while flaming coal is, the, is a frequently used translation, again, the Hebrew word here is different. The Hebrew word is one for a flat stone of the kind used in baking bread being heated in an oven over a fire and being handled with tongs as the shaped dough is placed on it. Think of an old-fashioned pizza cooker in a pizza place or, you know, like this pizza stone, except that it would be only about the, as big as your hand for the loaves of bread. What we have here is a picture of the awesome majesty of God and His kingship over all creation. God is the one who created the universe. As the angels note, it is full of his glory. God is the one who rules the universe as its creator. That is his right and prerogative. God is the one who understands the very heart of all the mysteries of the universe and knows what is right and best for each thing in his creation. God showers his grace on that creation, and in particular upon us, his greatest creation made in his image. God offers forgiveness by that grace which we can never earn and purifies us by that which we cannot make of our own choosing. All we can do is accept this gift when it is offered or not. God desires a relationship with us, calling us to him for a purpose, and we need to respond like Isaiah did, here am I.
You know, there's been a popular meme that has hit my Facebook feed a number of times. It goes, no matter who is elected president, God is still king. Let me say that again. No matter who is elected president, or was elected president now, God is still king. Easy to say, especially if you're on the winning side. But do you believe it? Can we move past our divisions in politics and opinions and rest in our unity on who God is and who is ultimately in control? Can we begin to actively seek healing as we move forward, looking to see the real people, individuals all, instead of the caricatures painted with a broad brush? Can we begin to pull together to make this community, this community, a better place during this Thanksgiving season and Advent season coming up? This is what it all comes down to in the end. We need each other. We are a family. We are all different and have different gifts, different temperaments, and different backgrounds. Yet without each other, we are walking wounded. If we function at all, we function poorly. We certainly cannot reach our maximum potential. God has called us into community. God has called us collectively His bride. God has given us the sacraments to strengthen our faith. And they are always done, guess what, in community. We can't do them separate from the congregation. And the world judges us by how we treat each other in large part. We have a challenge before us as we move into this next season and stage in our history. We are more divided as a nation than just about any time previously that I know of. I don't want to argue the causes. It's a fact noted by many people. We have people who have been hurt on both sides of the spectrum in the last year in particular. We have people who are now grieving. They are our neighbors, our friends, and our family. I call upon you, don't be stupid and unfriend people. That's a Facebook term, unfriending people. Because of politics and positions. I know of even family members, not of my own, but of some families that have cut off communications over this. Reach out and remind each other that Jesus is King. And that we have more in common through Him than we have different. Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is King. Jesus is King. <clears throat> then begin to share the love of Jesus with those around you in a deliberate way. It will be tough at times, particularly with those grieving, but persevere. Remind folks that even in this time of uncertainty, we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to celebrate. We have a lot to look forward to because God has promised it. And God never fails. God is holy, holy, holy. Lord of heaven and earth. All creation testifies to His glory. And we have the privilege of His unconditional love and His Spirit within us. May we recognize God's majesty and authority even as Isaiah did. And take comfort in knowing not only who God is, but whose we are. And resting in that love, may we know the peace and assurance that the Holy Spirit brings, that we might bring God praise with all that we do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our next hymn is number 239, For the Beauty of the Earth.
them by your Holy Spirit. Make each church a haven of physical and spiritual salvation. Use our tithes and offerings to safeguard the weak and vulnerable through the ministries of this congregation. And as our ushers come forward to take our morning offering, may you meditate on God's blessing and goodness in your life that you give joyfully and generously unto the work of his church here in Morning Sun. Together let us say the unison prayer of dedication. We work for you, God, in whatever we do. Paid labor, volunteer work, our home life, all our time we spend for you. Thank you for jobs which provide us with an income. We share the fruit of our labor with you, knowing that you are the great provider. Use these offerings in your kingdom work as you provide good news, healing, and hope to all people. Amen. Please be seated.
One of the joys and privileges we have is being able to pray for and with other people, knowing that we shall be heard by God through Jesus Christ. There are a number of announcements, or not announcements, uh, but things I want to bring up for prayer today. One is, to start, first one is Thanksgiving. I want to thank the veterans who have served this country in a variety of different ways. Would you please stand if you've served? Well, thank you for your service at this time. I also want to pray for about the riots that have been going on. To pray for the people that have been impacted by them, by this senseless and pointless destruction of property, of lives, and to pray for those people who are rioting that have allowed their rage to overcome their civility and good sense. As noted at the beginning of the service, we need to pray for Christine's brother-in-law and the radiation treatments he's going to begin. Are there other joys or concerns to share at this time? Yeah, Bob. I just want to point out the one that's on there, Maxine Green. I know nobody here knows her. She was a follower of myself and Jack Fell for years. And uh, she passed away on Thursday. Last few years, she's been at a uh, climb center. And whenever I'm down in Burlington shopping, I always stop in with my guitar and did a few songs for her. And today we're having a memorial service for her. Okay. We don't have to know the people we pray for to be effective in our prayers. That's one of the wondrous things of God's grace. Do we have any other concerns to share at this time? Or Joyce? Yeah, Doug. Joyce's grandpa went home this, this week. Jody's grandfather went home to see God, the, the Lord, this week. Okay. Any other joys or concerns to share? They were going to have possibly come in for Elmer. Yeah. Yeah, she's stable at the moment. Any other joys or concerns? Then let's come before God in prayer, knowing that He knows our needs better than we do ourselves, and He delights in answering prayer according to His will. God, our Father, Creator of the universe, Giver of every breath we take, great provider of all, we just give you thanks and praise. Lord, you are such an awesome and amazing God. If we were in front of you like Isaiah was, we too would be on our knees, saying, woe is me. I am undone, for I am a person of sinful lips, from a people of sinful lips, unclean lips. But we thank you, Lord, that your grace is sufficient for all and that you chose to pour out that grace in your mercy upon us, giving us your Son to die for us, to cleanse us of our sins, and raise him again that he, we might have new life, be new creatures, be a new family in him, able to do what we could not do before, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we give you thanks and praise. We give you thanks for those people who have served their country, who have felt it as a calling. Lord, there are many after effects of that service with many of these veterans. I pray that you would pour your grace and mercy out upon them that as their physical, mental, and spiritual ailments strike, that you would give them peace. For all those who are sick and are hurt, Lord, we ask a special measure of your spirit and your healing hands to heal them and make them whole according to your will and purpose. 
We give special prayers for, St for Stan, for Christine's brother-in-law, that as the radiation treatment goes forward, that it would be effective, Lord. And we ask prayers for the family, that they would be strengthened during this time. They've been through so much with the various family members and their struggles with health. We just pray that you will bless them. May they feel your presence. May they recognize your will and place their trust in you. And Lord, for those that have gone on to see you, that have passed on, those left behind grieve and mourn, and we pray for them as well. May they know that peace that passes all understanding and only comes from you. May they keep their eyes fixed on you and the promise you have given us of a future where we will see each other again and we will sing praises together and we will have more joy than we know what to do with. Jesus, Prince of Peace, come back soon. Bring your peace to the entire world as every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. Until that time, Lord, be with each one of us. Give us wisdom so that we understand what it is you're calling us to do. Give us the courage of heart to say, here am I, send me. And the joy to celebrate even in times of sorrow and grief. And give us the perseverance of spirit to complete the tasks you have for us. To answer the call you have placed within us. That one day we might hear those words, well done my good and faithful servant. And Holy Spirit be poured out upon this church. Expand its boundaries and ministries. Keep it from evil. Lord, may it be a light in the darkness of this world and a beacon of joy and hope, a hope that never fails as together we share the love and mercy we have learned and received from Jesus Christ, that together we might bring you praise and glory. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now if you would turn to page 632, we're going to sing the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you would stand as you're able and join me in singing our closing hymn, number 350, Hark the Voice of Jesus Calling.
Now may you answer God's call in your life going forth from this place. Renewed in your determination to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, recognizing his authority and kingship over all. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.